Hello everyone, I just want to thank you again for tuning in to uh, this channel. Uh, I do uh, hope that you're enjoying the, the, the content. Um, I this, this is the video where I address Tony Morris and his manipulative and shameful comment uh, about, you know, where he's guilting the, the teenage witnesses about their, their, you know, what we should withhold their driver's license or what have you, uh, unless they dedicate, basically. I'm going to address that. And there's some things that Tony and the, uh, the Magnificent Seven, I believe it is a total of eight governing body members. Uh, so I believe it's Tony and the Magnificent Seven, I'm going to refer to them as. Um, there's some things that they need to get right with heaven. Uh, and that's what we're going to discuss in this video. This video got a little longer than I wanted it to. So there's going to be a part one and then there's going to be a part two. The plan at this moment, I'm so, I'm so close to having part two done right now, that the plan at this moment is that part two will be released within 72 hours of this video being released. I've got to lay some foundation. It's going to take two videos in order to do it uh, to make the point. But I don't think you're going to be disappointed by the time that you see the end of this. Uh, so I certainly invite you to stick around, watch part one, enjoy it, and then come back and enjoy part two as well. If you have not seen the new documentary, I heard it was new, I don't know, but it was on Vice TV about the Jehovah's Witness organization. I just seen it like four or five days ago, and it is here on YouTube. If you have not seen that, I highly recommend that you go look it up on YouTube and watch it as well. It's about an hour and a half. There's some things in there that are said by former Jehovah's Witnesses that hit home with me because it sounds like we had a lot of the same serious, uh, the same experiences as former Jehovah's Witnesses uh, in our dealings with this particular religion. So let's get this video started. Uh, my, my, my lawn guy is here. He's making his way outside my office right now with a weed eater. So let's go ahead and get this one started. You already already know where we're going. I'm not going to come back after this one and discuss it. You'll just get part two in about three days. Enjoy. In the previous video, I had to address an individual who outed me as a deceptive fraud, stating that I was never actually a Jehovah's Witness due to my never becoming a baptized witness. For the record, I am a baptized Christian. I simply never surrendered my God-given right to free thinking over to the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. It appears that to some, despite my being raised from birth as a witness, my testimony as a former witness is completely and totally invalid because I wasn't a baptized witness. Well, this week it is my turn to call someone out for being a deceptive fraud. As I stated in an earlier video, I wanted to revisit Tony Morris's comments in regards to withholding the teenage witnesses' driver's licenses if they do not dedicate through baptism. This dedication through baptism, in reality, is the act of surrendering or submitting to the lordship of the governing body. Of course, what the person dedicating through baptism doesn't realize is that this commitment makes it much harder to leave the organization, which is the true purpose that it serves. Using guilt and shame in order to herd their members into baptism clearly allows the governing body to sink their narcissistic talons deeper into the consciences of their prey. As we establish the foundation for this video, I would like to share with you a comment that was left on the previous video. It appears that Brother or Sister Massey here, I'm, I'm not sure, took offense to my reference to Tony Morris's comment concerning teenagers and baptism. It appears that my statement warranted the following comment. Holding teenage, teenagers' driver's licenses if they don't get baptized? Question mark, question mark, question mark. You are one of the biggest frauds and liar I have never seen. Even real ex-Jehovah's Witnesses know that's not true. Gosh, you are the devil in person. Stick around, brother or sister Massey. By the time this video is over, you may have a different perspective concerning who was actually the devil in person. Uh, I do not believe it is a coincidence that your comment falls right in line with today's subject matter. I will give you a hint. The devil doesn't limit himself to just one person. Also, as a witness teenager, I remember being taught that the words golly, gosh, and gee equate to using Jehovah's name in vain. Uh, you may want to refrain from using those words in the future. I would, I would just hate to hear of you being called before the elders uh, for using profanity. Now, let's take another look at the clip that inspired this video. It is brought to us from a 2015 Jehovah's Witness Assembly Convention. Governing body member Tony Morris is discussing the importance of the witness teenagers dedicating to Jehovah's organization through 
baptism. And using the power of suggestion, the power of suggestion, Innocent Brother Morris plants the thought that the young witnesses should be restricted from obtaining their driver's licenses unless they commit to subjection through baptism. I would like to extend a formal invitation to Brother or Sister Massey to follow along with the rest of us as we listen to Brother Tony here as he expresses his love and genuine concern for the salvation of these young, innocent teenage witnesses. For him, and uh, <laughs> it's not helping you. No, uh, this is to you personally. He's got to make you firm, not Grandpa. Jehovah has got to make you firm. And we have that opportunity to have all that love and interest of those strong in the truth, but this is personal. We've always made that point very clear. And you young ones, uh, we've been entreating you. You've got to get that clear, especially as you get older. The only way you're getting through this storm, the great one, is your relationship with God, your personal relationship, just like everybody else. Unless you're a toddler, we know how Jehovah sanctify them. But as you get older, you are responsible. Remember the nice demo? We've mentioned that before. Well, I'm not ready to get baptized. Okay, let's hold off on your driver's license. What? I'm 16, what are you talking about? I'm ready, I know I'm ready. Yeah, you're ready for a driver's license, but you're not ready to dedicate your life. Hmm. Explain that one to heaven. <laughs> That's why we repeated it on the program. I have already addressed Brother Tony's reference here to dedication through baptism or lose your licenses before ever obtaining them. What I truly want to address today is this very manipulative and shameful statement. Yeah, you're ready for a driver's license, but you're not ready to dedicate your life. Hmm. Explain that one to heaven. You're ready for a driver's license, but you're not ready to dedicate your life. Explain that one to heaven. In other words, you're not ready to dedicate in subjection to the governing body. Tony, it seems to me there are a few things that you yourself, along with the remaining governing body members, may want to explain or get right with heaven before further concerning yourselves with the subjection of these teenagers. Let's take another look at the Watchtower dated February 1st of 1993 concerning godly subjection. We read this on two previous videos, but regarding the subject matter we are discussing today, I find it necessary to visit this article once more. Paragraph 7. With the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, God used him and his immediate apostles and disciples to serve as his spokesman. Later, the anointed faithful followers of Jesus Christ were to serve as a faithful and discreet slave in communicating to Jehovah's people how to apply Bible principles in their lives. Godly subjection meant recognizing the instrument Jehovah God was using. Paragraph 8. The facts show that today the faithful and discreet slave is associated with Jehovah's Witnesses and represented by the governing body of these Witnesses. That body, in turn, appoints overseers in various capacities, such as elders and traveling representatives, to direct the work on a local level. Godly subjection requires each dedicated witness to be in subjection to these overseers in keeping with Hebrews 13.17. Be obedient to those who are taking the lead among you and be submissive, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will render an account that they may do this with joy and not with sighing, for this would be damaging to you. Okay, please allow me just a moment for a quick review of what we just read. With the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, God used him and his immediate apostles and disciples to serve as his spokesman. I totally and completely agree. Later, the anointed faithful followers of Jesus Christ were to serve as a faithful and discreet slave in communicating to Jehovah's people how to apply Bible principles in their lives. So they're laying the foundation here for the governing body. Godly subjection meant recognizing the instrument Jehovah God was using. So we have to recognize the instrument that God is using, which of course is the governing body. Paragraph 8. The facts show that today the faithful and discreet slave is associated with Jehovah's Witnesses 
and represented by the governing body of these witnesses. The facts show this, but the facts can never be seem to be presented conveniently. That body in turn appoints overseers in various capacities, such as elders and traveling representatives to direct the work on a local level. In other words, the governing body that is the instrument that God is using uh, appoints governors over the people. Godly subjection requires each dedicated witness to be in subjection to these overseers in keeping with Hebrews 13.17. Be obedient to those who are taking the lead among you and be submissive for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will render an account that they may do this with joy and, with, and, and not with sighing for this would be damaging to you. So these governors that are appointed over you have to give account for the people. They have to give an account and they want to be able to give a good account of the people to the governing body. Uh, therefore, we are to be in obedience to the local governors that are appointed over us. According to the governing body, godly subjection means surrendering to the godly authority entrusted by God himself to the governing body and the local overseers, elders, otherwise known as governors that are appointed over you. If one is not submitting to these authorities, then you are not in subjection to God. Now, let's take a look at the Watchtower dated July 1st of 1973 as it concerns the Holy Spirit's role in working with the governing body. Consider, too, the fact that Jehovah's organization alone in all the earth is directed by God's Holy Spirit or active force. Only this organization functions for Jehovah's purpose and to His praise. To it alone, God's sacred word, the Bible, is not a sealed book. Many persons of the world are very intelligent, capable of understanding complex matters. They can read the Holy Scriptures, but they cannot understand their deep meaning. Yet God's people can comprehend such spiritual things. Why? Not because of special intelligence on their part, but as the Apostle Paul declared, for it is to us God has revealed them through His Spirit. For the Spirit searches into all things, even the deep things of God. So we have learned that Jehovah is exclusively working with and through His earthly organization known as the Jehovah's Witnesses. He has appointed the witness governing body as His faithful and discreet slave that is mentioned in the book of Matthew. We see here, according to the Watchtower, that God's Holy Spirit is exclusively directing this organization and this organization alone. Because the Holy Spirit works with the Jehovah's Witnesses alone, they are the only religion that truly understands and properly interprets God's sacred word, the Bible. They're the only ones that can understand it. Now, there certainly appears to be many other religions claiming the name of Christ, and they certainly appear to be doing His will as well. Since God is exclusively working through the Jehovah's Witnesses alone, how exactly does God view these other so-called Christian religions? Let's turn to chapter 5 of the 1958 Jehovah's Witness Paradise book for the answer. Chapter 5, God promises his friend to bless all human families. We're not going to read all of this. I just want to hit on a few topics as I establish my point. In obedience to God's command to become many and fill the earth, Noah's sons and their wives began bringing forth children. Thus, as time passed, the earth began to have more and more people on it. But as they grew in numbers, the worshipers of Jehovah grew less. The people lost sight of the good examples of faith and devotion set by Noah and his sons. They chose to follow the way that was bad in God's eyes. This, of course was pleasing to the unseen devil and the other disobedient angels. In fact, they helped mankind to go in the wrong way. Although these wicked spirits were not destroyed by the flood, they were no longer able to materialize or clothe themselves with flesh as they were once able to do. God had taken that power away from them because they had misused it. And since they were no longer a part of God's heavenly organization, they became demons, the servants of Satan. This made him the prince of the demons, and so Satan and his demons, the disobedient angels, worked to turn men away from God. All who did turn away were used by them to form a visible, earthly organization that was under their control. 
The first evidence of this organization was the city wicked men began to build about 130 years after the flood. So the construction of the Tower of Babel was under the direction of Nimrod. Under his direction, the people began building a temple tower, which they planned to use in the worship of false gods. Drop down to paragraph 5. God was not pleased with this plan. To break it up, he stopped the building of the tower. How? By suddenly causing the people to speak different languages instead of just one. Paragraph 6. With their language confused, the people had to stop work on the Tower of Babel because they could no longer understand one another. It was no longer possible for them to live and work together. So they picked up their household goods and went far away from Babylon. Accordingly, Jehovah scattered them from there over all the surface of the earth, and they gradually left off building the city. Paragraph 7. Now, it's believed that the Tower of Babel was actually constructed in the city of Babylon. Paragraph 7. It was from the city of Babylon that false religion was carried to all parts of the earth. Because of the bad influence of this false religion, the worship of almost all people today is not pleasing to God. Their religions are to him like the smell of rotting flesh in a hot sun. This is because their worship has been spoiled by the bad religion of Babylon, which has been passed down through the ages to this modern world. Okay, so all the religions except the Jehovah's Witnesses, of course, got their origination at the city of Babylon. So, according to the governing body, all worshipers and followers of Jesus not serving as a Jehovah's Witness collectively are all practicers of false religion. The origins of these practicers of false religion, including those claiming to be followers of Christ, can be traced back to the Tower of Babel. And since the Tower of Babel was the first sign of Satan's earthly organization, when God scattered everyone to the different parts of the earth, they took their false religion with them. Now, it is very clear that there, are, that there are indeed many false religions existing in the world today. We're discussing one right now. But according to the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses, even those practicing in the name of Jesus as non-Jehovah's Witnesses are of Satan and the Tower of Babel as well. Since my becoming a Christian, God has revealed things to me concerning these so-called practicers of false religion. I would now like to share an encounter I had with the Holy Spirit as God was leading me and teaching me to trust in Him as He was slowly setting me free from the confines of a brainwashing cult. One morning around 4 a.m. in the fall of 2001 as I was driving to work, I said a prayer that completely changed my life. I discussed this in greater detail in a previous video. During that prayer, I asked God to take away my fear of questioning the teachings of the religion of my birth. Since I had been taught from birth that only Jehovah's Witness publications were inspired of God, I was afraid of reading anything not produced by the organization. My thinking had been so warped by the brainwashing that I even believed my school books were of Satan. Due to this understanding, as I was growing up, all of my life I had a very little desire to read anything at all. I genuinely believed that reading non-witness material was very displeasing to Jehovah. My disinterest in reading even extended to the Bible. At that time in my life, I still did not understand the difference between religion and Christianity. Very soon after I finished that prayer, I suddenly had an overwhelming desire to read the Bible. I began in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I had to get a New King James Version because the New World Translation just wasn't doing it. At the completion of reading these books, for the first time in my life, I recognized Jesus' purpose in being sent to the earth. Through this, I realized that God was indeed setting me free from the confines of the Jehovah's Witness religion. As I was learning to trust God, I then prayed and asked Him to send a true man of God in order to help me gain even more understanding. I was now trusting these practicers of false religion. Two weeks later, I had just returned home from work and sat down to eat as I heard a knock at my front door. It was a local Christian pastor conducting a Wednesday evening neighborhood outreach. I immediately realized that God had answered my prayer. I sat down with him for about two hours and, of course, he invited me to his church. I was still mildly nervous about attending this so-called 
church of false religion, but I trusted that God was indeed answering my prayers. As I stood there during praise and worship, still mildly nervous during my first, my very first Sunday morning visit to this church, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. If you do not believe the Holy Spirit speaks, I highly recommend that you knock the dust off of your Bible and begin reading it. My seat was in the center of the church, uh, towards the back of the auditorium. Uh, there was approximately 350 to 400 people in attendance, with about 40 of those in the choir alone. I was nervously amazed at everything I was hearing and seeing. As I stood there listening to the beautiful harmony of praise and worship, a very authoritative yet gentle thought came to my mind. It said, look around this church. I knew immediately there was something very distinct about this communication. I heard it again, look around at the people in this church. I slowly turned my head from right to left, carefully observing as the people were singing to and praising the Lord. I was then asked the following question, do you truly believe that I will destroy these people that are gathered here praising in my name simply because they are not known as Jehovah's Witnesses? I answered back and I said, no, Lord, I no longer believe that. At that very moment, I felt a heaviness appear to lift off of me. I now know that it was in that moment that Jesus had set me free from the dogmatic chains of cult religion. My prayer had been answered, and I no longer feared questioning the teachings of the Jehovah's Witness organization, and I was certainly no longer intimidated by the governing body.